I was a 404 boy, I wouldn't hurt nothing. The first two casualties I seen, they had brought them back from the front on the Jeep. It made me sick and it made me mad too. And that's when I, where I turned into a real soldier or what? I wanted to kill every one of them. I just couldn't help it because they killed my two buddies. I was kind of vicious a little bit. I, I felt like I could shoot them, as I said, not better than I doing it. And it didn't get no better, it got worse. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was drafted, but I went in a little early because they, what I was working at, they said, we'll give you six months deferment if you just go to the office. So I said, well, six months is not very long. I will have to go anyhow. So I volunteered not to take it, but I, I was drafted. They took me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They had three lines there, they said. One was the Navy, the Marine, and the Army. Said, get in any line you want to get into. But I had a brother in the Army, and I thought, said, so, well, I'll pick the Army. So I got an Army line. And they had uh, earphones laid on the desk. They said, <clears throat> all of you put your earphones on. They were going to give you a Morse code test. And they had a big sheet of paper there. We're going to give you two letters. And if they just seem marked down yes or no, they would say, did it, da, da, you know. So you knew that was different. And you check, no, it wasn't the same. And if it said, did it, did it, you knew that was the same. I'd never heard of Morse code before. So I was kind of guessing as I went down the sheet, guessing. And I turned it in, and when we got out and symbol, they called out three names, and I was one of them. And they said, uh, we're going to send you to communication school. So that's where I started. Then we went to Camp Rooker, Alabama for advanced training. And then when we finished there, they sent us over to sea. Landed in Liverpool, England. They took us out and assembled us. Normandy had just happened. We had uh, so many casualties in Normandy, we're asking for volunteers. We want to replace all the injured. I said, I'll take one of them's place. So they, there was two or three that volunteered. So they sent us to jump school in England. I never rode an airplane before. They said, tomorrow we're going to make a jump. Well, I was kind of a little excited about it. Anyhow, they carried us to the airport. You go in the hangar, and there's a stack of chutes high as that ceiling. And you just go in there, and you pick out the one you want a job with. I got the first one, because I didn't know. Well, no use to go through them, because you can't tell. Put it on. They've helped me, showed me how to put it on and everything. Went outside, the plane was sitting there, C-47. And uh, we got on that plane, and they just took off, and they, they said, watch these lights. One was red, and come to one that was green, that means you were ready to go. And if you can't jump out, we've got somebody here to help. You sitting there with all that girl, and they said, stand up and hook up. And you have to have that thing to where when you jump, it don't catch you under here. So you just stand up and hook up. So that's what you do. And I'm to check 
the guy in front of me, make sure he's hooked up right. One behind me is supposed to check me. We didn't have to have a light because they had two guys, one on each side of the door to help you out. Some of them freezes. They can't help it. They're good soldiers, good paratroop, but they freeze. So I remember one was, he had both hands like that on the door. You can't get out. So I dove over his head. At the same time, they helped him out. But anyhow, no, no accident happened. You have to have five jumps before you get your wings. So we got our chute, throwed it on the truck. And the next day we did the same thing. I never rode a plane for it, but the first five times, I thought five times, every time I get on a plane, I have to jump out of it. We jumped three days in a row, and on the fourth day, we jumped two times. We jumped, put the chute back on the truck, went back to the airport, went to the hangar and got another chute and repeated it, same thing over again. Give us five, that give us, says you've earned your wing. They tried their best, that I thought, to run you out. All they were doing is testing, and I thought they was mean. I said, God, I, they're treating us like dirt. But in here, the day I finished the fifth one, there was the best people that I've ever met. And the question was, is anything you need? Do you need any money? Do you want a three-day pass? I said, yeah. First job was kind of excited. I kind of liked it. But I didn't like the other, no more jumping. I said, I didn't, don't like it. But uh, I said, I volunteered, and I'm going to stay with it. So I did. We knew that there was a jump coming up on, on the, and during the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, the best I could learn about, it was somewhere near the Neuse River. In Europe, there's a lot of stubby trees. They grew up, they, they just almost looked like they cut off with the wind, you know, the limbs out. They're stubby and, you know, when you come down and hit them, they could hurt you. So they decided not to jump. They flew us across the English Channel. We landed near the combat zone and the snow was all over the ground then. We formed our company together and you could hear the heavy artillery going off. So we went towards it, just started walking right to it. And soon you could hear the small arms fall. Kept right on going towards it. I was a farm, old farm boy, I wouldn't hurt nothing. They turned me into something else. The first two casualties I seen they had brought her back from the front on the Jeep. And I got, brought her right up to me. And I, I seen the two casualties. It made me sick. And it made me mad too. And that's when I, I don't know what I was in, where I turned into a real soldier or what. I, I I wanted to kill every one of them. I just couldn't help it because they killed my two buddies in my company. They got up there first and they got shot right away. So I was kind of vicious a little bit. I, I felt like I could shoot them, as I said, not better than I doing it. And it didn't get no better, it got worse casualty part, because I'd be talking just like I'm talking to you. Five minutes later, the word was, Jack got it. That was, that was all it'd take. Jack got it. And I said, well, I was talking to him a while ago. He said, yeah. 
He was right here a while ago, but he got it. Went on and on and on. Never stopped. That never stopped. They told me it's war. You protect yourself first. And they'll get you if you don't get them. I kind of live with it. And actually, I was better off then than I am now with it. So after 70 years and never talked to it about anybody for over 70 years, you think them guys are brave and you think I'm brave, but I'm not. I'm not brave. I was scared. I was worried every day, every minute really, day and night, that I would be next when you got your friends right with you and you lose them. You keep saying, well, I'll be next. But I guess you could call me lucky because I have been shot at and I know they were shooting at me because there's nobody else there but me. So I knew they were shooting at me, but I never got hit. I was treated one time for a little injury on my hand and one time for frozen feet. Of course, I wasn't worried about no Purple Heart. I didn't know I was going to get a Purple Heart. I didn't care where I got one. But anyhow, the oldest time I knew for sure is uh, when I was discharged, they said, you get your Purple Heart? And I said, no. So they handed me one. We was on one patrol, patrol one night, and um, we come to this town. We walked to the town and we kept walking down the street. And all of a sudden, they started blasting away. Front of us, two sides. We couldn't contact nobody else what we were going to do. So we went down one block and went back out of town. And there was only three of us. We went to a door. There was an old man that lived there. And he welcomed us in his house. And so I stood there at that door. He had a, the glass. I stood there all night long with my M1 rifle. I was ready to do that if a German walked up to that door. None showed up. The next morning, when it come day, I could see. We could tell how they dressed. I had to look down, and I seen them. A, 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 it looked like, well, it looked like a man. He had the black long coat on, and he was walking at the road. It was full of snow. It was snow on the ground, but you could tell where the road was at. He was walking, and I heard one blast of machine gun. Brrr, and it, it fell. I told the lieutenant, I said, you see that black thing down there? He said, yeah. I said, they just mowed him down. I said, there's a machine gun rest right there in that group of bushes. He started calling in artillery and, and uh, mortar fire, and it hit the barn of the house. We was here at the house. There's the barn. Hit the, hit the barn. Uh, and set it on fire. I mean, it's bad to do this. But the guy wanted to get out there and open up his board so he could let the horses out. But we was afraid to let him go out the door. We didn't know where he would go or where he'd come back or not, go and tell where we was at. We didn't know we couldn't do it. So I don't, I don't know what happened to the horses. But anyhow, we couldn't let him go. They kept shelling that fire. I think that what they did is run them out right quick down, evacuated them. But I believe, I don't want credit for it, but I believe if I hadn't have seen it, we'd have all been dead. Eventually we'd have left out and we'd have start went trying to find our, the rest of the crew. I do believe I saved our life. I never told nobody that before. But that's the way I feel. Because we had went out of the house. They, had to, they could have mowed us right there. Being in the communication, everywhere the military goes, 
they want communication with them. We had the radio man, and also we have a reel of war. It's a mile or more war. And uh, we have to carry that. Everywhere we're going, that little old roll, we putting that little war along with you. And uh, you hooked up your telephone on it, you know, and communicate back to your headquarters. And the outpost, what they call the outpost, that's out in no man's land, you know. All that war strung out for sometimes a mile. And if a tank runs over or something, you have to go out there and take that war, digging it out of the snow, and, and walk, hold it in your hand until you can feel where it was broke at. Then you splice it back together. I remember one night, uh, I kept going out to the outpost and when I got up there to it, poor guys, they were sleeping. I could hear them snoring just before I got to it. So I woke them up. I said, don't worry about it. Nobody else is going to know about it. I said, but one of you stay away. Because the captain was called up and said, I can't get nobody. Find out why. So I did. Nobody never knew it. I wasn't about to tell them, because I understand. If they were lucky they were warm enough to sleep. I could not sleep nowhere because it was too cold. Tur turns out that that was the coldest one in history over there. What I did at night is walk back and forth. The snow would get as hard as cement on. <laughs> And uh, I'd, I'd fall asleep walking. I would stagger out of that trench, get right back in it, start walking again until I'd fall asleep again. Stagger out of it. Every time I'd stagger out, I'd get right back in it. All night long, keep from freezing to death. My brother, he was in the army, and he was stationed in... Pearl Harbor, he was there when they bombed it. He never talked about it. But I asked him one question, where were you at when they bombed? He said, I was in my barracks. And he said, I happened to be in one end, they blew up the other end. That's, that's all I ever heard him say. But I do know when we got home after the war was over, a plane come over the house, and he was under the table. I do know that. But anyhow, he went to Europe, and I was already over there. This is something you're not going to believe, probably. We were in a convoy. We were going one way. Another convoy was going the other way. I, I didn't even know he had got there. The Europe. They two trucks. Going on, and they stopped just like that. I looked over there, and there was my brother sitting in that truck. I said, do you know where you're going? And of course, he, back then it was Tent City. You didn't go to no barracks, you had Tent City. He was going to Tent City number two. If he had asked me that, I, I couldn't have told him because I didn't know where we was going. <clears throat> but anyhow, I said, when we get to where we're going, I'll see if I can get permission to come by and see you. So sure enough, we got there. I asked. They said, we'll carry you over there, and you can spend the night with me if you want to. I said, that's what I'll do. So just come back tomorrow. Any way you can get back. But anyhow, I did that. You can't imagine how, how you feel something like that happens. And you... You don't know where people even believe it or not. <clears throat> but that's like a script, a movie script that's set that way. On one of our mission, patrol, patrol mission, lieutenant 
in charge of the squad. He had a map, and he said, we're coming up on a, we didn't know what it was, what was a consecration camp or a forced labor camp. He said, when we get there, go in and see if we can find any survivors. When we got there, I went in. It was nothing but concrete, made out of concrete all the way around, no seats, no beds. But on the wall, I could see some door, door, iron door with a handle on it. And I went and pulled, a, pulled them out and come up. There's people in them. And you look down at them, and they just looking up. You can't, you don't know where they dead or alive. They just look at you. And uh, they're, 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 they starved them so bad, their eyes were sunk way back in their heads. We had medics with us, but I, w I never did ask, because they, they had, they could tell where those were. Anyhow, I was afraid to ask them, did any survive? So I don't know for sure. They, only they know they wanted to kill all the Jews. I don't want you to visualize looking at what I look at when you have so many Casualties, you, you stack it, stack them on top of one another. Snow was all over the ground, and they'd bring them up there. And they got so many, they started putting them on top of one another. I mean, it sounds gross, but it's it's just the way it has to be because when they come to pick them up, they don't have to go all over the place. But they pick them up one at a time. Nobody welcomes you home. Nobody asks you a question about it at home. You don't tell nobody at home. Some of it I can't talk about. It's, it's bad. Yeah, in combat, you don't even think about the stuff that I think about now. It just reverses. I worked with somebody just like me and you together for <clears throat> 37 years. He never knew that I was ever in the military. He never asked, and I didn't tell. 37 years together. Work. I mean, that's the way it was. I had a plan for suicide. I had two kids when I was ready for it. I, I used to fish a lot in fresh water, so I knew a place where there was a lot of alligators. And I thought to myself, I can go down there one night and just jump in the river and the alligators will take care of me. I think a lot of suicide victims, if they'll stop and think, I thought about my kids, they'll be going to school and the kids will be asked, what happened to your daddy? And, and they won't be able to answer it. And I said, if I do it, all it'll do is satisfy me, but it won't satisfy nobody else that knows me. So that kind of went by the wayside, but I keep dreaming about the war. In fact, I had one week before, last week, really. I got a telephone call that, uh, the Germans was in Virginia. They said, get ready to evacuate. So I remember we had something to eat on the table, and I took my two kids. 
I said, let's eat right quick because we're going to have to evacuate. I don't know where we was going, but they say you got to evacuate. So they, they were just kind of slow getting telephone ring again. Said, you got to get out of your house right now, evacuate. So I said, let's go. I went to the door and I'd done that, and I woke up. True American would die for your America. That's the way I felt. I didn't mind dying for you at all. I said, I'm going to do my job, and if it kills me, I'm gone.